Welcome to Zoology of Exitons Lecture 1. Today we're going to talk about textbook exciton physics, and I want to say what textbooks I mean when I talk about that. So I'll show you some. The classic one is Cattell Solid State Physics. This is used at both undergraduate and graduate level, and chapter 15 has a good discussion of exciton physics. Slightly more advanced is Martyr's Condensed Matter Physics. Uh, that's in chapter 21, where they do similar discussion to Cattell, but maybe you know slightly different notation. And, and again, this book is a slightly more advanced treatment in general. And then a super advanced textbook where you can find some of these ideas is um, Mahan's Many Particle Physics. Uh, if you go to chapter 9, you find some of this discussion, but much, much more advanced. You're unlikely, unlikely to find many courses taught from this textbook. And it may be that as we go on in this course, we'll return to Mahan a little bit. But we want to start with uh, the most basic textbook treatments we can come up with. So what we're going to do is start out by talking about a single particle band diagram. Um, we'll use that to introduce the hydrogenic model of excitons. And in that model, we can calculate exciton binding energy and exciton radius. And we'll show how that works for the particular case of gallium arsenide, which is a very important optoelectronic material and sort of has <coughs> very well established exciton physics. So I'm going to go back and take a look at this real space snapshot of a generic exciton, a bound electron hole pair, right? And so the idea from our introductory lessons is that this object uh, is treated as a quasi particle. Uh, and we want to know what's the binding energy between the electron and hole? How big is the quasi particle? And in the future, we'll talk a little bit about how long the quasi-particle lives. In other words, what is its decay rate? In addition to that future elaboration, we'll also talk about how to categorize excitons by their size. We're going to start that today quite a bit. Um, but we also need to think about what is the origin of the positive and negative charges. Uh, and that will lead us into topics of Mott-Hubbard and spin-orbit type excitons. And then, in addition, it's really interesting to think about how to categorize excitons by what is in their immediate environment. So are there a bunch of other charges? Are there a bunch of other excitons? How are they interacting? How are they interacting with lattice vibrations? So these are all topics that we will come to in future lectures. <clears throat> but let's start out by talking about the single particle energy bands in insulators. I'm going to call them insulators. I consider insulators and semiconductors to be the same thing. At zero Kelvin, all semiconductors are insulators. So we're going to say that we start out with a full valence band of electrons. And we draw that on these axes where the vertical axis is energy and the horizontal axis counts the number of quantum states. So this is like a density of states picture. So if you take a little horizontal rectangular window, you would have some total number of states per unit energy in that window. In addition, you've got an empty conduction band. And the meaning of an insulator is that the full valence band is separated from the empty conduction band by a region of energy where there are no allowed quantum states at all. And that's called the band gap, right? And so then the idea is we can shine light on this sample. And if the light has enough energy, it can excite an electron from the filled valence band up into the empty conduction band. So the filled red circle is meant to represent the electron and the empty circle is the hole that it left behind. 
So in this excited state picture on the diagram, we have a single electron in the conduction band, a single hole in the valence band, and we should immediately ask the question, are those excited charges independent particles? And the answer is probably not. If you, in, in almost every situation, um, you would expect these excited particles in the solid to interact with one another. And in particular, they're charged particles, so they're going to see uh, Coulomb attraction. Right? The excited electron is negative, the left behind hole is positive, and they should interact via Coulomb attraction. And if they can make a bound state, we're going to call it our exciton. So this is an, sort of like an energy space picture of how the exciton forms, where we just look at the excitation from the top of the valence band to the bottom of the conduction band and ask how those excited particles talk to one another. <coughs> And so we can think now, in, instead of this thing as being a, um, a really complicated, excited state of a solid, let's just think of it as an isolated object, where we've got the electron and the hole uh, in the background of a medium that represents the complicated solid. And in that case, if we just want to talk about how they interact with one another, we can write the Hamiltonian operator for their interaction as kinetic energy of the electron, kinetic energy of the hole, and their Coulomb interaction. And so some of the parameters in this Hamiltonian are important to talk about. So m e star in the first term is the effective mass of a free electron in the bottom of the conduction band, the excited electron. Similarly, m h star is the effective mass of the free hole in the top of the valence band. We're going to define exactly what we mean by this in the next slide, but for now I'm just telling you that it is something special to pay attention to. And then the parameter epsilon in the denominator of the Coulomb interaction is the static dielectric constant of the material in which this excitonic quasiparticle is living, is embedded. Okay? <clears throat> so these are all really important parameters, and a lot of our discussion of excitons is going to center on how do we determine and understand the meaning of these parameters in different contexts? But let's go back and recall exactly what we mean by effective mass in solid state physics. So on the left, I'm redrawing our energy, our energy picture of how the solid looks, where I just draw the energy bands vertically and their density of states horizontally, right? So the red curves here represent density of states in the valence band, density of states in the conduction band. I can be a little bit more detailed and give you, instead of the density of states, the band structure of the solid. And so on the right, I'm drawing a picture of the band structure of the solid, where <clears throat> on the vertical axis, I'm still plotting energy just like I was on the left. But now on the horizontal axis, I'm plotting a uh, wave vector or crystal momentum. And this is actually related uh, to momentum sort of dynamically, but you can also think of the wave vector as essentially the quantum number associated with each individual uh, quantized energy in the solid. <clears throat> and so typically what you see is that at least close enough to certain special points along the horizontal axis, the energy bands in red in the energy wave vector plot are nearly parabolic. And so for a particle living near the bottom or top of one of those bands, the energy is this parabolic function uh, that basically just looks like the quantized or quantum kinetic energy of a single particle. And so the effective mass is defined using this expression for the parabola as the thing setting the curvature of the bottom or top of the parabola. So the effective mass of the electron in the conduction band is determined by this curvature, and the effective mass of the hole in the valence band 
is determined by that curvature. And so that's what we mean by the M stars in the Hamiltonian. Um, and so these are, these are basically two equivalent pictures of how to think about excitons depending on what exactly you need to know or talk about. If you're only worried about how much energy it takes to make the excitation, you might only think about the energy picture in energy versus momentum picture. Now you're going to get some information about what are the effective masses. And so let's input this into the hydrogenic Hamiltonian that we just talked about <clears throat> with this understanding of what M star E and M star H mean. We can now transform this Hamiltonian into a product of relative coordinates and center of mass coordinates. So we define the relative coordinate as the difference between the electron and hole position vectors and the center of mass coordinate as the effective mass weighted position of each. All right, and so then the Hamiltonian breaks up into a sum of pieces uh, and the wave function breaks up into a product of center of mass wave function and relative wave function. And often we don't spend too much time thinking about the center of mass wave function and actually I think that may be in, in a lot of research papers in exciton physics you do. Uh, but for today we're just going to think about the relative wave function. So then the relative wave function obeys this Hamiltonian. Sorry. <clears throat> Where now instead of being a complicated function of the position of two different particles, we have a single effective particle with mass mu. This is the reduced mass, which is me star mh star over their sum. Laplacian operator, which now depends depends only on the relative position, and then the Coulomb interaction, which again depends on relative position, even in the initial Hamiltonian. And so the energy eigenvalue that you can get by solving this time-independent Schrodinger equation gives you the exciton binding energy. And the good news is that problem's already been done. All we've done in this discussion is to transform the particle hole interaction problem into a hydrogen atom problem, right? Or to put it maybe more accurately, a positronium problem. Sorry. So yeah, this Hamiltonian, uh, as I wrote in the text, I forgot to mention, is basically the same Hamiltonian that you would find for a hydrogen atom if m sub h was equal to the mass of a proton. Uh, but since ME, M, ME star and MH star are often similar in magnitude, it's more accurate to kind of think of this quasi-particle as acting like a positron, an elect sorry, positronium, an electron-positron pair where the, where the masses of the two particles bound together are somewhat similar. <clears throat> but in any case, whether it's hydrogen atom or positronium, we've solved the problem. It's one of the one of the handful of exactly solved quantum mechanics problems and the energy eigenvalues look like this where I'm writing it out as the energy associated with quantum number n is minus 13.6 eV times the reduced mass divided by the bare electron mass divided by the dielectric constant of the medium squared and the principal quantum number squared where n is just 1, 2, 3, etc. So it's important to know the reference point for this binding energy. This is binding relative to essentially infinitely separated electron hole pairs where the Coulomb interaction between them has gone to zero. And another way to think about that is this is the binding energy relative to free or independent charges in the conduction and valence band. Okay, that's something that I think is uh, maybe takes a while to sink in exactly what that means. Uh, so we'll probably say it a few more times. Another thing that I want to point out here is this model, you know, it seems like it might be a little bit oversimplified in that, you know, how is an optically excited state of a solid at all similar to a hydrogen atom? And the answer is we've hidden a lot of the solid state physics and many body complexity 
into these special parameters the reduced mass and the dielectric constant. So remember, mu includes essentially the, the full band structure of the valence band and conduction band. Maybe full is too strong, but it definitely includes the low energy or the band bottom, band top band structure. And so that's a lot of solid state physics inside that parameter mu. Uh, and that's one of the real values of this model is you take that complexity and you sort of bundle it into this single number. Epsilon, the same way, includes a lot of the response of the entire solid to applied fields. Right? And so we've got tons of physics in here, even though the model seems oversimplified, it's really not. And that's one of the things that we're going to do over the course of the next few lectures is to try to identify um, how we can take the sort of conceptual perspective of this picture and elaborate it by understanding the meaning of mu and epsilon in more and more complicated circumstances. In addition to calculating the energy levels associated with this bound state, we can also calculate the average separation between the two particles. So again, this is I'm not rederiving this. This is supposed to be sort of known established quantum mechanics. And so we're just sort of pulling it again from the textbooks I mentioned in the beginning of the, of the lecture. The average separation associated with the nth quantum state is given by this expression. So you've got reduced mass, bare mass, dielectric constant, principal quantum number squared, and you multiply through by the Bohr radius associated with the real hydrogen atom, just to give it the right units, frankly. And that Bohr radius is 0.0529 nanometers, so about half an angstrom. One of the pieces of intuition you can get by comparing the energy expression and the radius expression is that the binding energy increases as the exciton radius decreases. That makes a, a lot of intuitive sense, right? The charges get closer together, the Coulomb attraction is stronger, their binding is stronger. But you can see it here. <clears throat> Discussing the, so, the average separation of the exciton also leads us to our first elaboration of exciton physics, which is to discuss Wannier versus Frankel excitons. And so very often what we're going to find is that the size of an exciton is often quite a bit bigger than the lattice spacing in the solid. And this is a situation that's called a Wannier exciton. Um, and so I kind of draw it schematically here. And I suppose in, in some ways this is meant to be the simplest idea in the sense that when you're this big, you can sort of imagine that you've washed out a lot of the lumpy details of the solid. And so it sort of now makes sense to think about the solid as being represented by epsilon and mu. And so a lot of materials that have one exitons are our traditional semiconductors like silicon gallium arsenide. Some materials can have an exciton where the separation between the positive and neg negative charges is comparable to the lattice spacing, and that's called a Frankel exciton. Uh, and this is a situation where some version of the hydrogenic model can still work, but you start to wonder about it quite a bit, and there start to there start to be some more questions you have to ask because now it's hard to imagine that a macroscopic dielectric constant makes sense, things like that. Um, so this is one of our important distinctions between Wannier and Frankel. Examples of Frankel excitons we'll see will be organic semiconductors and general molecular solids, as well as some strongly correlated materials, especially where the valence and conduction bands are determined by uh, d atomic states. And in particular, this diagram that's meant to be our schematic or zoological map of excitons uses this average separation equal to the lattice spacing as a fairly stark delineation between um, varieties of exciton that are unusual, maybe that don't satisfy the hydrogenic model very well, and models that do out here in the Wannier. 
And so then the distinction between Frankel and Wannier, what I'm really trying to show you in this plot with this grit, uh, group blue mist, is that the distinction between them is not going to be super sharp, right? There are going to certainly be some types of excitons that are not clearly Wannier or Frankel. Let's do a case study to end this up today. Let's take a look at gallium arsenide. So gallium arsenide uh, has been studied for a long time. I'm showing you some data from Sturge in the Physical Review in 1962, where they're showing the optical absorption of the material as a function of photon energy at a bunch of different temperatures. So let's look at the, at the one, the filled circles that's measured at the lowest possible temperature of 21 Kelvin. And so what you see is that for energies lower than about 1.51 electron volts, you don't get any optical absorption at all. <clears throat> and then there's a sharp onset at about 1.51 electron volts, okay? And so let's just calculate the binding energy of excitons in gallium arsenide using the hydrogenic model. I'm taking some data uh, from, I believe I took this data from Cattell, I should have said that, the, text, the textbook Cattell and uh, Cattell solid state physics. The mass of an electron in gallium arsenide near the bottom of the, oh, that's not right. So I, I mix this up, this should be the The valence band effective mass should be the mass of the hole. And the conduction band effective mass should be the mass of the electron. It sort of doesn't matter because they, they both get lumped into the reduced mass of the exciton anyway. So even if I didn't mix it up, it's, it's not going to matter in the end. It's the same answer. But anyway, mass of the hole, mass of the electron. Um, dielectric constant 12.9. When I use these band structure parameters, mh and me, I get a reduced mass of 0.037m, where m is the bare electron mass. And so let's just plug in up here for n equals 1, and you get a binding energy of negative 3 milli electron volts, which means that the exciton is 3 millivolts more stable than a free electron and a free hole together. Now it's quite small uh, binding energy. It's actually you know, substantially smaller than uh, thermal energies at room temperature. And so let's take a look at the implications of that. Um, the idea here is that this onset of optical absorption is the direct creation of excitons, right? And the fact that we have a really sharp peak on top of a sloping background is one of our first signatures that there are, in fact, excitons in this material, right? And so we have a sharp onset. The onset is not the signature. Sharp onset that comes up to a peak and then sort of rides on this sloping background. That's one of the real signatures. And so let's talk about that a little bit. In particular, let's talk about the fact that for three millivolt binding energy, we expect a really significant temperature dependence to the stability of excitons, right? So if you're at a temperature of 21 Kelvin, you have this object bound by three milli electron volts that's constantly exchanging energy with a thermal reservoir at this temperature. And somehow you're able to maintain this sharp peak, but as you increase the temperature, you see the sharp peak get broader and broader. And so what one of the things that's happening here is that the excitonic feature, which is what we're going to call this sharp peak, is getting washed out by interacting with the thermal reservoir. Right? And so at room temperature, you almost don't see any evidence of a sharp peak at the onset of optical conduction. The fact that it's shifting to lower energy is a different solid state physics effect that I'm not going to talk about. Um, and so we're going to call this sharp peak the exciton peak. 
And then this background that it's riding on is the continuum of the continuum absorption due to creating free carriers. And so the idea is there's a free carrier background, right, everywhere. And the exciton peak is three millivolts below the onset of free carrier absorption. That's what it means to have a three millivolt binding energy. And so this is me trying to model that for you so you see what I mean. If you think about parabolic valence and conduction bands like we've talked about, you can calculate explicitly the density of states of the degenerate Fermi gas in the bottom of the conduction band or the bottom or the top of the valence band. And you see that it goes as the square root of energy. So you have this square root background on the blue curve. And then you put a sharp peak due to absorption into the excitonic levels that's bound by the exciton binding energy relative to the conduction, uh, sorry, the continuum absorption. So imagine extrapolating this square root function all the way down. The peak occurs at three millivolts below where that absorption crosses zero. And so this to me is one of the key experimental signatures of excitons is this peak continuum structure. And we're going to see some more examples of that as we go through this course and do more case studies. So I'll say one more thing. Let's go ahead in and do and calculate the average separation of the electron and hole inside an exciton in gallium arsenide. So we're going to use the same parameters from our energy calculation and plug into the average separation in the lowest quantum state, n equals 1. So you get the 12.9 uh, dielectric, oops, 12.9 dielectric constant, the ma bare mass of the electron, reduced mass is 0.037 times the bare electron mass, times the Bohr radius, so 18 nanometers separation is huge. So this is a really big exciton, way, way bigger than the lattice spacing in gallium arsenide, which is only 0.56 nanometers. So this is really a, a Wanye exciton where the separation is quite a bit bigger than the lattice spacing. And so this is the end of the lecture. We've just talked about basic hydrogenic model of exciton physics, how it relates to solid state physics parameters. And next time we're going to continue on with this type of analysis in a slightly more complicated context where we talk about tr transition metal dichalcogenides.